Hi, I'm Frédéric Desbiens, Program Manager for IoT and Edge Computing at the Eclipse Foundation. Welcome to Game of Protocols, the presentation where protocols will fight for your hearts and minds. All right, so what do we have on our plate today? Really simply three things. First, uh, I will explain to you why you need to pick a protocol. Uh, this seems trivial, but you know, some people think there's a one-size-fits-all approach in the market, and uh, I will just want to show that that's really not the case. Then uh, we'll review a few established players in the market, okay, so options that are mature, that you can use right away, and that are widely supported. And then uh, we'll have a glimpse at a few uh, emerging challengers, so protocols that are maybe a bit less mature, but show a great deal of promise for the future. All right, so let's get this show started. So why exactly do you need to choose? Um, you know, I think the best way to illustrate this is with quotes from real developers, real people that I met at conferences or that in, I interacted with over the internet. Um, you know, one common thing that I will see is, well, I don't need to choose, you know, with you know, Ajax Foundry or with whatever product you want to put in there, okay, fill the blank, uh, you know, that product has multiple protocol support, so I don't need to choose one. And okay, yes, maybe at the technical level it's true, but the problem with that approach is that, you know, um, then you don't take into account the specific use case you're having. You're just, you know, picking random, software stacks and, and parts even for your project and you're not getting the best fit for your specific use case. Then the second option would be something along the lines of, oh, REST is simple, you know, I can do everything with it, it's widely supported, so why would I need anything else? Yeah, but the problem is that, yes, REST is widely supported, but it's not necessarily tailored for the world of edge computing or even IoT, you know. Uh, if you have a tiny, tiny MCU and you need to make the battery last for five, uh, five years or more, then uh, it's probably not the best option, even if it's simple to use and widespread, uh, you know, in its, uh, in its adoption. And finally, uh, another thing that I heard a lot is, well, plain TCP is good enough for me. Uh, you know, I can work with that. It's, you know, it's literally everywhere. And, uh, you know, I can, I can use straight UDP maybe uh, if TCP is not, uh, is a no-go for my project. And, uh, okay, <laughs> if you want to go that route, it's, uh, it's up to you. But the, the, the problem with that approach is that essentially, um, you know, you're operating at a very low level and it, it this has consequences. So, the reason why you need the right protocol for the right job is really about three things. First, okay, uh, the, your choice of protocol really will impact many, many, many things about your project. And, and that's really important, okay? The, the, the performance, the throughput, okay? Uh, depending on the protocol you will use and the specific amount of data you need to shuffle and, and the conditions of the network, you know, they are better choices than others. Then there's the battery life. In IoT, that's a fundamental concern, the number one constraint you need to, to, to think about. Uh, developer productivity is another thing. I mean, uh, maybe uh, plain TCP is, uh, you know, an option that you will get nearly everywhere or plain UDP, but then you need to parse uh, all of those packets on your own Etc. Etc. And what about security? And what about encryption? And what? I mean, you are using the lowest common denominator if you do that, and you won't be productive. And then there's the whole question of security and implementing security on your own. You know, is one of the biggest uh, the biggest mistakes you could do. I mean, okay, maybe you're a better developer than me. <laughs> Fine, but. Um, you know, writing security code is really, really something that not everyone can do. So why not use, you know, mature uh, solutions that will integrate it for you? Okay. Then, uh, when we think about REST, uh, the thing is, uh, as I mentioned, HTTP as a protocol, it's fine. And REST as an approach is fine, but it's lacking many of the features that you will see uh, IoT specific protocols uh, got. Uh, quality of service, reliability, and there are many, many others. So uh, assume that each and every feature that the protocols I will talk about today 
or, or well, not will, I am actually talking about today, uh, about those protocols. So all of the features they've got, uh, most of the time, HTTP won't have them, okay. And then there's a whole question, uh, once again, of productivity. Uh, Low-level protocols will slow you down. Uh, I need to reemphasize that point, right? Uh, especially if you're working on using C, you know, working on a Zephyr application or something like that, uh, writing C code, do you really want to write all of those lines of code to allocate memory, deallocate memory, uh, you know, uh, create buffers, uh, parse payloads and that kind of stuff? I mean. That's not solving the problem. You're just writing, you know, utility code or glue code. And we don't want you to do that. We want really to focus on your specific use case, which means that using a higher level protocol is a good option. All right, uh, so now let's review our main uh, contenders for today's, uh, today's uh, game of protocols. Co-app, DDS, MQTT, and uh, Lightweight M2M. Okay, and we'll review them in alphabetical order, uh, although on my slide here they are not, okay? And uh, this is to emphasize that I have no favorite there. It's really about picking the right protocol for the job. Okay, first, as a reminder, uh, you know, the, the Zephyr RTOS, and I know that uh, many of you uh, at this conference really care about this, uh, the Zephyr RTOS really has built-in uh, support for three of my m four main contenders. So I put links here, so if you download the presentation, you can access directly uh, the samples for CoAP, Lightweight M2M, and MQTT. And as you can see on the diagram, this is really an integral part of you know, uh, the, the, the Zephyr RTOS. And this, this Quinn distinguishes really uh, Zephyr from competing options in the RTOS space in the sense that you have all of that as open source as part of the main tree, you know, and those clients for the various protocols are, you know, high quality and tested alongside with the OS, which is not something that you will find uh, in some competing options. Okay. Now, uh, going forward, so what is the constrained application protocol or CoAP? Okay, so uh, CoAP is a protocol really that has been engineered from the ground up to really target constraint devices. Okay, it's uh, managed by the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, and documented in a specific RFC. And then uh, there's a bunch of other RFCs that, you know, provide additional features on the top of that. Uh, really, the, the, the obsession of the designers of CoAP was to have a minimal overhead, okay? Uh, CoAP can run on the top of most devices that can support UDP or will use protocols that are roughly equivalent in terms of, um, in terms of uh, resource usage as, uh, as UDP. Uh, the thing with CoAP is that really, uh, you know, it's meant to run over the internet, okay? So you can use it to integrate devices that are on a same network, but you can integrate those devices to general nodes over the internet, or even uh, on, you can join devices that li live on distant constrained networks, uh, and those networks would be bridged then by the public internet, okay? So all of those, uh, deployment models are, are, are possible with CoAP. Um, CoAP uh, intentionally has been designed to be really, really, really close to HTTP. So this is a request and response protocol and it follows the REST model. So the get, put, post and delete verbs are used. Uh, it's using URIs, response codes, MIME types. Uh, so if you're familiar with HTTP, uh, CoAP is fairly easy to pick up. And one thing that has been adjusted is its strong support for CoAP for multicast because uh, more often than not, you will, you will want you know, to broadcast a bunch of data to a number of nodes. All right, so um, at a deeper level, what are CoAP's features? Um, first, Everything that CoAP does is asynchronous. Okay, so it's really <laughs> your you send message and you know execution continues right away. Uh, low overhead because it's on the top of UDP is another big concern. And and even I mean in the design of the protocol, 
the headers will uh, typically be about uh, four byte long only. Okay, so that's fairly compact when you compare to many other protocols that are used in the data center. Uh, all of the payloads and you know uh, the, the, the messages themselves are very really simple to parse because they are exactly um, they are exactly replicating what you will find in HTTP. And uh, there are many HTTP-like techniques that you can use with co-op. Okay, so URI, content type support, that kind of stuff, proxy, caching, really all of that is accessible when you work with co-op. So uh, very briefly, let's have a look at, uh, at the stack for co-op. And uh, an interesting thing is that uh, really uh, co-op is well supported over uh, Bluetooth and uh, six low pan. Uh, as is lightweight M2M, uh, as we will see a bit later. Uh, and, and the fact is uh, co-op uh, in its approach is, is also relying on UDP and something called DTLS, which is, uh, you can see it as a specialized version of TLS uh, to go along, uh, along with it, but it's a bit, it's a bit simpler and uh, a bit, a bit uh, lighter on resources. Anyway, so uh, essentially the whole point of co-op, as you can see in the stack, is really to send messages over this request and response um, pattern. All right. Um, if you have to pick a co-op stack, obviously on device, if you work with Zephyr, you have built-in support and there are many uh, small, uh, small, um, small libraries written in C that you can leverage for that. But on the server side, especially if you need to write a fairly ambitious um, application that leverages co-op, the most popular option, uh, at least in my perspective, that's uh, currently in the market is Eclipse Californium. And Eclipse Californium really has a whole bunch of additional features over, you know, simple co-op implementations that you will find uh, elsewhere. For example, it implements observe and notify. So by default, co-op is a request and response, but you can make it, uh, you know, you can use it in a kind of publish and subscribe model by using the observe and notify features of co-op. Uh, it, uh, California also supports uh, blockwise transfers. It implements the latest version of DTLS and has even uh, experimental implementations for co-op over TCP. So, you know, if you are, um, if you want to benefit of some of the advantages of TCP, then uh, you will be able to leverage them. And uh, there's something called o OS Core, so uh, a, a kind of security model for RESTful environments uh, and uh, co-op. Uh, as experimental support for that standard as well. Also, co-op will enable you to bridge co-op uh, co and HTTP uh, uh, connections through cross proxies. And it comes uh, in the case of Californium with a scalable web resource framework, and you even have a kind of runtime container for JavaScript mashups. And uh, you can leverage an OSGI wrapper if you are working you know, on, uh, on a managed server that will support that. So. Uh, it really, Californium is a very mature project that we've got at the Eclipse Foundation. It's certainly uh, well maintained and has tons of adopters in the market. And uh, I invite you to have a look if you are interested in working with uh, co-op. And, and Californium is both a client and a server implementation. So if uh, you need to uh, access to co-op resources from a Java application, then you can also uh, leverage Californium. Okay, uh, our next contender now for your hearts and minds is Data Distribution Service or DDS. Okay, uh, DDS is a different animal than from co-op. Really, uh, it's a publish and subscribe protocol optimized for machine to machine communication. And it's really focused on uh, the decoupling of applications. Okay, so the really fun thing about uh, DDS is that any node can be a publisher, subscriber, or both simultaneously. And the reason why is that is that there's no central broker or anything like that in DDS. Okay, so there's just, you know, DDS is a fabric or a mesh, and, you know, the nodes communicate with each other, uh, you know, over that mesh. Uh, DDS is already widely adopted in specific verticals. You see it a lot in aerospace, defense, air traffic control, robotics. And uh, DDS is a specification of 
the DDS Foundation, which is one of the foundations uh, that are related to the Object Management Group, so, or OMG. And OMG, they are the godfathers of UML and many other interesting technologies, uh, if you are less uh, familiar with them. So there's a formal spec for DDS, and you can uh, certify your, uh, your projects uh, and products against it. Okay, so what are the main features of DDS? Uh, DDS at its core has this concept of a data space, okay, that will enable you to decouple, okay, applications from one another. So this decoupling is spatial, so the nodes can be on any network anywhere, and temporal in the sense that the communication is not happening necessarily in real time. Uh, as I mentioned, DDS is completely decentralized, which means that there's no single point of failure. So maybe that's an interesting feature for your use case. And uh, DDS supports a quality of service policies, okay? And those policies, they express specific constraints about the temporal and uh, and the about the time and av availability of the data, okay? And that's really, uh, really something nice about it. Uh, on the top of that, uh, DDS has mechanisms for uh, built-in dynamic discovery, okay? So essentially, uh, out of the box, DDS nodes can discover other nodes uh, around them and uh, establish communication uh, with them. So this is uh, our uh, protocol stack for DDS. And uh, in this case, there's an interesting uh, distinction. DDS can run over out-of-the-box TCP or UDP, and it has a kind of wire protocol for interoperabil interoperability. <laughs> uh, that's quite a mouthful. So DDSI RTPS is the wire protocol for interoperability. And then on the top of that, uh, you have DCPS, which is literally the published subscribe model of, uh, of DDS. So those two things are, uh, you know, uh, documented and, and um, there are uh, distinct uh, specifications around them. Okay, now uh, if you want an implementation of DDS, uh, one of the leading ones is certainly Eclipse Cyclone DDS. So this is a pure C implementation of the protocol and it's got really a tiny, tiny set of uh, runtime dependencies. So. Uh, typically, it will compile very well in a variety of environments. It's really compact, so it will fit, you know, if you strip a few features in as little as about half a me megabyte of memory, you know, at runtime. And out of the box, it supports multiple platforms. And uh, it's, uh, well, it's tested over Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, but then uh, many people have run it in a variety of environments. Um, the great thing about Cyclone DDS is that it's now a tier one uh, middleware in the ROS2 operating system. So the robot operating system, very popular as the name suggests in robotics, as uh, Cyclone DDS as a first, uh, first class citizen there. So uh, it's certainly an interesting uh, option if you are invested in that particular ecosystem. Okay, uh, continuing now with contender number three, Lightweight M2M. So what is it exactly? So in this case, Lightweight M2M has really a, a tight focus on lightweight and low power devices, okay? And uh, Lightweight M2M requires co-op. So it runs on the top of co-op, but as you will see, it brings a whole lot of value-added features on the top of it, okay? Um, one interesting twist of Lightweight M2M is that it defines an extensible resource and data model, okay? So you can really out of the box uh, work with what's there, but you can extend it in a standard way so that even if, um, you know, uh, let's say you, you produce a device and it supports Lightweight M2M and people don't necessarily have uh, the documentation for that or they are not necessarily familiar with the the, the the specific resources and, and data that you are exposing, then there are uh, standard ways to discover that using lightweight M2M and then to leverage that. So uh, this extensibility makes it really attractive. Um, the specification for lightweight M2M is owned by a, a nonprofit called OMA uh, Specworks, and you've got the link to their website on the slide. Okay, so. What's so interesting about Lightweight M2M? Uh, 
uh, Lightweight M2M really, uh, as you will see, really focuses on the management of devices. So it offers you, for example, bootstrapping mechanisms. So if you, uh, for example, you produce devices and you ship them from your factory with specific uh, keys and encryption certificates, that kind of stuff, um, the thing is your, your customers then can deploy a bootstrap server where your devices out of the box will connect to that bootstrap server. And after that, they will be able to retrieve their production uh, certificates uh, and, and encryption, you know, from uh, parameters from literally the bootstrap server. So uh, this means any 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 device that you ship, you know, from your factory to your customer uh, doesn't need to ship specifically with certificates that belong to the to the to the certificate authority of your customer. You you just bundle your own, and the Bootstrap server will make the substitution in your customer's environment. And this is really a powerful mechanism in Lightweight M2M. Uh, Lightweight M2M will will uh, take care of device configuration, fault management, configuration of devices, control reporting. Uh, but one uh, interesting thing that it does is to support firmware updates. So um, a lightweight M2M supporting device connected to a server, the server can, you know, uh, start the process of updating the firmware, uh, the device, you know, typically this involves to pass a specific URL to the device so that it will know from where to download the new firmware. The device will do this and automatically deploy the new firmware, reboot, and etc. etc. So uh, all of that is really well defined in Lightweight M2M, and it's an interesting option uh, if this is the kind of scenario you want to, to, to implement in your device. So the Lightweight M2M protocol stack is interesting in the sense that it will support TCP uh, and, and UDP uh, with or without DTLS. Uh, but it will see, it will also run uh, over SMS, so you can you can send uh, SMS messages over a cellular network, and uh, the lightweight M2M stack will be able to understand that uh, as well. Uh, and obviously, uh, the diagram here doesn't repeat everything that, about about co-op, but really you see that lightweight M2M runs on the top of co-op. And then uh, there's the principle that you have specific objects in the extensible data model that are uh, leveraged by your application. So if you want to work with a lightweight M2M, uh, there are projects at the Eclipse Foundation for that, Eclipse Leshan and Eclipse Wakama. So Leshan is not a complete server, but rather a library for implementing uh, lightweight M2M clients and servers. It's very mature and well supported. It's very simple, okay? So the, it's not using any frameworks of its own uh, and it's using uh, really few dependencies. And it provides you a basic web UI to discover and test the devices, okay? And, and, and really, you, you just build the code using uh, Maven install, so it's, uh, it's very straightforward to work. And it's leveraging Eclipse Californium uh, under the hood. So really, we are drinking our own champagne here for sure. Then on the device side, obviously, there is built-in support for Lightweight M2M in Zephyr. But uh, if you are in another type of environment, then Eclipse Wakama is a C client implementation, fairly, fairly portable, I would say, that many people have adopted in the market. And our last contender, last but not least, is MQTT. And MQTT previously, you know, uh, earlier in its life was an acronym, okay? It stood for uh, MQ uh, Telemetry Transport. And MQ was a reference at the time since it came from IBM. So maybe you heard about uh, MQ series or uh, WebSphere MQ from IBM. So, uh, you know, the MQ reference is there and, uh, and MQ stands for message queuing. Anyway, nowadays MQTT is, is the name, you know, it's not an acronym anymore, okay? Um, and really, uh, it's a protocol uh, that targets constrained devices, but specifically constrained devices that operate over low bandwidth networks, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, it runs over TCP, but there's a flavor, so to speak, of MQTT, MQTT SN, and SN stands for sensor network, that runs over UDP, but MQTT SN is, is less mature, let's say, than uh, plain MQTT. And, and really, the, the focus of MQTT when it was created at IBM uh, and, and uh, with the help of Eurotech, one of our members in Eclipse IoT, um, 
is really that it was targeting uh, SCADA types of applications. So, you know, industrial types of applications that need to control machines or uh, get data out of machines and that kind of stuff. It's really uh, using a publish and subscribe architecture and is not meant for durable and persistent messages. So you, you don't run your whole business with, let's say, banking transactions over MQTT, but you shuffle data that eventually will come into those business applications. And MQTT is a specification owned by Oasis. All right, so what are the features of MQTT? MQTT defines... Uh, three levels essentially of quality of service at most once okay so if your message is ever delivered you know there will only be a single copy delivered at least once where you have at least the guarantee that one message will be delivered but there could be multiple copies and exactly once so uh, you have a guarantee that uh, each message will guarantee uh, will be delivered it's guaranteed and only a single copy will be delivered obviously <laughs> you know as you go from zero from to one to two there you know the throughput falls because you know the servers and clients are exchanging more messages in order to to implement the quality of service uh, a nice thing about MQTT is that it implements persistent sessions, okay? So essentially, uh, if you don't use persistent sessions, every time that the client connects, it must specify, okay, I want to subscribe to this topic and that topic and that topic, okay? Uh, persistent sessions means that uh, a client automatically will be reconnected to the same topics all the time, you know? Uh, you don't, uh, so this simplifies your code. Um, MQTT has also a feature for uh, what is called retained messages. Normally, uh, by default, uh, you send a message and whoever is online as a subscriber will get the message at that time, okay? And then the message is gone. But uh, MQTT has a feature where essentially the last message sent on a topic will be retained so that if there were clients that were offline, okay, subscribers that were offline, they will get that message, you know, first thing when they will establish their connection. There's also a notion in MQTT of last will and testament. So essentially, if a, a, if a client or subscriber is disconnected violently uh, from, uh, from the broker, then uh, essentially uh, it will be able to send uh, a last, uh, you know, a, a last will to not, you know, a, a predefined message that will announce to the rest of, uh, of the network that, uh, that specific device is gone. And then um, there's also this notion of uh, keep alive on MQTT. So even though it's running over TCP, it will, it will keep the connection open for you, uh, which is uh, typically more uh, something you will find in UDP. So this is the MQTT protocol stack, and, and here it's fairly, uh, fairly standard. So uh, MQTT, the plain version, so to speak, runs over TCP, and you've got MQTT SN on the top of UDP. Okay, so now we have our four contenders. So which one should you pick? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> before I say that, we've got implementations. <laughs> I, I got ahead about... Uh, of myself there. So we've got implementations for MQTT, obviously, at the Eclipse Foundation. Eclipse Paho is a collection of MQTT clients in several languages, and they target multiple platforms, okay? Uh, and they have, you know, all of those clients have a wide uh, assortment of features, uh, automatic reconnect, offline buffering, etc., etc., even high availability in some of them, okay? And they can be uh, either blocking or non-blocking in, in some cases. So depending on your style of programming and the environment that you are targeting, uh, this is certainly a strength. And then uh, we've got the very popular Mosquito Broker. It's part already of most uh, Linux distributions. And uh, Mosquito is written in C and uh, is, is certainly a very popular option as far as MQTT brokers are concerned. Okay, now, <laughs> before we get to the choice, <laughs> I must also cover very briefly a few emerging challengers. And here we will cover specifically Spaplog and Zeno. So one of the great things about MQTT is that it doesn't say anything about the payloads. So it's fantastic because you've got flexibility. Um, one of the bad things about MQTT is that it doesn't say anything about the payloads. So you have, when you deploy an MQTT compatible solution, let's say uh, you buy robots 
from uh, from one pro supplier and then you buy a software stack from another and then a third uh, another machine from a third supplier they all speak mqdt but you will need at a minimum to configure them you know to point them to the right topic or to parse the payloads or to 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 massage the payloads in a specific format etc cetera, etc cetera. and all of that is error prone it's time consuming it's frustrating so um a few bright people at uh, Sirius Link and Inductive Automation, two Eclipse members, uh, came together and uh, with other community members to start what we call the Eclipse Spotplug Working Group. So Spotplug is both a specification at the Eclipse Foundation and uh, uh, there's also an implementation in the Eclipse Tahoo project. So what Spotplug is about, it's, it's essentially about three things. First, it defines standard payloads, okay, standard payloads uh, on the top of MQTT. Then uh, it defines standard topic structures and finally stateful session management. And all of that, okay, make it possible out of the box, okay, when you have devices that support Spotplug, they will be able to speak to each other out of the box without, uh, well, with a minimum of configuration. And, and this is really a game changer. Um, so, as I mentioned, Spotplug is both a spec and an implementation, and all of that, both the spec and the implementation in Eclipse Tahoo are completely open source. And, and this really solves a big problem in the market, really. Uh, so, MQTT is fantastic, it's there to stay, but by running Spotplug on the top of MQTT, you can really, uh, you know, get at, uh, at the next level. And then we have an intriguing new kid on the block, uh, which is called Eclipse Zeno. Uh, so Zeno is a protocol that comes from our efforts in edge computing. And really, it's a pop sub protocol that mashes, you know, storage and uh, queries and computations, you know, in a fabric. So the great thing about Zeno is that it unifies all of the data in the system, data in motion, data in use, data at rest, and even computations, okay? It's a unified model. And it blends the traditional pub-sub primitives that you will see in MQTT and DDS, for example, but with, you know, the dimension of geographically distributed storage. So this makes it very attractive for edge computing because obviously uh, in edge computing, you want to have the data and compute as close to the source of the data as possible, okay? And, and finally, Zeno has been, uh, highly optimized for low latency and high throughput. It's really the obsession of this team. So uh, Zeno uh, is available in a variety of, of flavors and they are working now on Pico Zeno, which is a C implementation that should fit, you know, on most uh, RTOSs. Uh, so it's still, uh, you know, an emerging project in the sense that uh, it's been around for a while, but they are working on, on, on many language bindings and stuff like that. But any Anyway, please have a look. I think that's certainly one of the most innovative uh, projects that we've got at uh, the Eclipse Foundation. So how would you pick any of those protocols really for your specific project? Uh, and there uh, really, there are three major things. There are many other things, but really if, if I want to boil this down to the fundamentals, you see them on this slide, okay? So first, there's your use case. Are you collecting data or controlling devices? That's really the fundamental question. If you are collecting data, uh, then probably a publish and subscribe protocol is the best. But then if you are controlling device, maybe a, a request response protocol could be used. But then, you know, there are many, many other considerations there. And uh, you sometimes maybe you will choose to use more than a single protocol in order to optimize, uh, optimize the solution, okay? Then uh, you need to think about your constraints really in picking. So your bandwidth, your battery, the compute power of whatever MCU you are using, you know, what are your constraints? Because some of those protocols will require a bit more resources than others. Some of them run just over TCP for the time being. So that's a bit more resource intensive since you need to maintain the connection, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many, many things to consider there, but you need to be aware of your constraints to make uh, the pick correctly. And finally, there's the whole dimension of support. 
Does it support the hardware, the OS that you have? Can you procure sensors and devices in the market that already supports it? And then your time to market for your uh, wider solution is, uh, is, uh, is faster. And that's, that's really an important dimension. And uh, you need to take that in, in consideration because once again, what you care about is delivering the solution, not to write low level code and, and uh, solder components together in order to, 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 to build your own sensors, right? All right, so uh, well, as I said, there are other, other factors to consider, but really those three are really the, the most important ones in my opinion. So now uh, I told you uh, a lot about the protocols and uh, the various implementations we have for them in the Eclipse IoT community. So what's the Eclipse IoT community? Well, essentially, uh, you know, it's 46 member organizations and uh, now uh, getting close to 375 contributors writing code in 45 open source projects and counting. You know, those, those numbers are never, uh, uh, you know, up to date. They always go up. Uh, and overall, when you consider all the projects we've got, that's roughly uh, 8 million lines of code. Uh, that you can leverage in order to deliver solutions. This is our memberships. So we have three strategic members, Bosch, Eurotech, and Red Hat. So those are the ones setting the vision for our working group and, uh, you know, uh, really uh, leading the others. But as you can see, we've got many, many uh, members there and a shootout to the Linux Foundation. Linux Foundation is a member of Eclipse IoT since um, Essentially, we are working together on promoting uh, the Zephyr real-time operating system and trying to make sure that our components work well on Zephyr and at the same time that our members are aware of what Zephyr has to offer in the, in the embedded space. And obviously, uh, Linux is another big environment uh, for us as well, so that's another place where we, we work together, uh, certainly. All right, so my call to you now that this presentation is nearly over. Uh, please join us, uh, please become a member of the foundation and please become a contributor to our uh, strategic open source IoT projects. Uh, you can contribute to any of the projects I described today uh, right now. You can submit PRs and if you submit enough of them and they are high quality enough, you can become a contributor even without being an Eclipse member. But we would pretty much uh, enjoy your support uh, if your organization can join the foundation. And uh, especially uh, in joining the foundation, uh, joining the Eclipse IoT Working Group would be the wise thing to do because this is where uh, things happen in Embedded and IoT at the foundation. So at this point, uh, the only thing left to say is a big thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, and uh, as I said uh, before, I'm uh, Frédéric Debien. Program Manager for IoT and Edge Computing at the Eclipse Foundation. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter as Blueberry Coder. And please visit our website at iot.eclipse.org. Thank you. <laughs>